Acts chapter 1. We've been preaching through the book of Acts, and uh, over the last about three months, we've made it all the way to Acts chapter 1. We are doing good, um, but we're going, we're going a little bit at a time. We're not doing verse by verse as much as these, these ideas. I want, I want you to see them, and that is this. Why did God bless the New Testament church? Why did God bless that church at Jerusalem? What was going on there that God just decided to pour out His blessing upon it? We see that God worked. We see people getting saved, and the church multiplied, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. We see the disciples doing some things and God responding in amazing ways. And I want to do that here. I want to see God work in our city, in our Jerusalem, in our church. So we've talked about several things. We've talked about how they were united. We've talked about how they had experienced the resurrected Savior. There's, there's so many things that have happened. I don't have time to review them for now, and I don't remember all of them. I hope you remember all of them, right? But I don't remember all of them. Um, I don't remember what I preached last week. Somebody had to remind me in Sunday school this morning. So that's kind of, kind of where I'm at. Tonight, Acts chapter 1, look at verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120, men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry, now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers of Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, a keldama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. You know the story, quick review. Uh, Judas had betrayed Jesus. After he betrayed Jesus, we understand from the Gospels that he went out, and the Bible says he hung himself. Peter gives us a little bit more details of what happened there. The Bible says, and Peter's the one that said it, um, falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. It's pretty graphic. This is what happened to Judas. He betrayed Jesus. He went out. He realized that uh, he'd done the wrong thing. He was guilty. He hung himself, died a horrific death. But Peter came, and he said, look what the Bible says about that. He said, look, for it is written in verse 20 in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Peter had been studying, he had been reading in the book of Psalms, and he realized that this particular event had been addressed before it ever happened. Here's the message tonight, and I'm going to give you some, a bunch to think about tonight and give you some illustrations from the book of Acts. What did the disciples do that God responded in such a favorable way. What did God just do? What did the disciples do that where, where God came and, and, and worked and the church multiplied and people were saved and, and the world was turned upside down with the gospel? Well, tonight I want you to see this. They studied the scriptures. They studied the scriptures. Now it's pretty simple, but I want you to see the examples and I want you to see some ways that you can study the scriptures and how that can make a difference in your life. All right? Ready, set, go. Why did God bless the efforts of the disciples so much? Well, they used the Scriptures. They studied the Scriptures. They knew the Scriptures. And God promised that the Scriptures would be effective and powerful. Now, we're going to look at an Old Testament verse, and we're going to look at a New Testament verse. The Old Testament verse is Isaiah chapter 55, 11. The New Testament verse 
is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. You're familiar with both of these verses most likely, but I want you to see them and I want you to know where they're at. So I want you to see the power that God has promised to the Scriptures. This is so important. As Christians, we need to study the Scriptures. We need to get familiar with the Bible. Not just read them, but study them. Not just memorize them, but study them. We need to get to know. Think about this. Everything that God wanted us to know, He put in this book. This is not everything God knows, but this is everything God wanted us to know. And if He put everything in this book that He wanted us to know, we ought to study it. We ought to study it more than we study sports stats. We ought to study it more than we study any other subject. We ought to know the Scriptures. I'll give you some reasons for that tonight. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, God promised the Scriptures would be effective and powerful. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. God's word is effective. It's not going to go out void or vain or empty. Hebrews 4.12, you know this verse, for the word of God is quick, that means alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. Remember, we're not talking about a sword. We're talking about the Word of God, just using a sword to picture it. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, the power of the Scriptures. Remember that when Jesus spoke to the men who were arresting them, arresting Him, they all fell over backward at His Word. They said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, and He said... So I don't remember the exact word. I think he said, I am he. And they fell over backwards just because he had said that. Oh, and the one small detail I almost forgot. God spoke the universe into existence. The power of the word of God. He created everything but the human race with a spoken word. God, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You go through that and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said, and it was so. It happened because he said, and I love, I, I think it's in, oh, I forget, verse 4 or verse 6, and he made the stars also. I just, I love that verse. There's so many stars, and it's just kind of like an afterthought because all of this happened just by the power of God's Word. If God's Word is so powerful, we need to study the Scripture. The Apostle Peter, he's, he's here at Acts chapter 1, and in verse number 20, he says, For it is written in the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 69, if you would turn there, I want you to see where it was written in the book of Psalms. Where had Peter been reading? Now, I don't believe at this time that the book of Psalms had been divided into chapters and verses. That happened later. But here you've got the apostle Peter, and he's saying, it's written in the book of Psalms. I've been reading, I've studied the scripture, and here's what the scripture says. Psalm 69 verse 25. Let their habitation be desolate. Let none dwell in their tents. If you go to Psalm 109, verse 6, <clears throat> you got the rest of that verse that uh, Peter puts this together. It's written in the book of Psalms. Chapter, Psalms chapter 109, verse 6. Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. The Apostle Peter had been studying this, and he understood that somebody was going to take his office, and it describes Judas very well. Let Satan stand at his right hand. Now, you've got to understand something about the disciples. These are not college graduates. These are not br they're, 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 they're brilliant men. They're, they're, they're wise men. They're smart men, but they're not book smart. They, they didn't go to school. They didn't go to college. They're... There, now, now maybe, maybe Luke, we understand he was a doctor, but the other ones, they are, they're, they're fishermen. They, they are not uh, educated men. In fact, the Bible says that they were arrested. They were brought before the, the, the uh, probably the high priest in this case, maybe the Sanhedrin, but they were brought before them. And the Bible says that they knew that they were ignorant and they were unlearned and ignorant men. These are not brilliant men. These are not Bible scholars. So how did they know so much of the Bible? What do you think about that? How did they know so much of the Bible? Well, they had just spent a lot of time with Jesus. Now, I want you to think about this with me for just a little bit. We have a few snapshots of the life of Jesus. 
a few events. I've not done this, but I've thought about it, and I've, I want to at some point. If you're to put all the events of Jesus that we have recorded in scriptures together, an afternoon here, a morning here, a night here, you put them together, you've got a few weeks of events. Jesus' ministry, we know, was over three years. And that's just, that's just the ministry. The disciples had, had spent days and nights with him for three and a half years. And what we have recorded is just a very short amount of time, just snapshots here, snapshots there, of the life of Christ. They spent all this time with Jesus. During the few events that we have a record of, Jesus quoted the Old Testament about 80 times. He quoted the Pentateuch alone. That's Matthew, uh, Matthew. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible. He quoted that part of the Scripture. Um, let me look, check the number out. 26 times. He quoted Jesus, quoted from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Psalms, Proverbs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, ran out of fingers, <laughs> Amos, Jonah, Micah, and Malachi. He quoted all of these Scriptures. These are Old Testament Scriptures. The disciples around Jesus, so often, I, I, I just have to believe that they heard him speaking, quoting scriptures more than just what we have recorded here. They were around Jesus. Wouldn't it have been amazing to hear everything that Jesus said? Wow. I mean, just think about it. We have some of it recorded here. But what, what if we could have heard everything? We, we can't, but what did he say to those priests in the temple? When he was 12 years old. The Bible doesn't say what he said, but the Bible said that he was there in the temple and he was, he was uh, dialoguing with them, disputing with the priests in the temple. What did he say to them? I would love to know. I, I, I just imagine he was probably quoting scripture, reminding them what the scripture really says because he knew all of it, right? What did he say to Peter, James, and John on the way down from the mountain after he'd been transfigured. I don't think Peter was talking much. right? He just opened his mouth and said, we need to build these three tabernacles. Oh, that was stupid. I don't know that he said anything. It may have been a quiet walk down the mountain. But if he said anything, wouldn't you have liked to heard it? All throughout his life, all throughout his ministry, he was, he was teaching and he was training. John said, in the book of John, chapter 21, verse 25, he said, there are so many, also many other things which Jesus did. The which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the book should, that should be written. This, that's extreme. That's an extreme statement to say, if we were to write a book of all the things that Jesus did, and many, many books of all the things that Jesus did, he said, I suppose that the world couldn't even contain that. John wasn't stupid, okay? He was ignorant and unlearned. We understand that. But the world's a big place. He, and he said, I, I, I suppose that we couldn't even contain all those works. If we only have record of a short amount of the time Jesus spent on this earth, and we have record of Jesus quoting nearly 80 verses from the Scriptures, how much more of the Scriptures do you think he might have quoted? I just, I just want you to think about this. I'm going somewhere with this. So I don't have a number. I'm not going to propose to you a number or the date that Jesus is returning in the rapture. Okay, that's not, that's not coming tonight. But I imagine there's a whole lot more verses that were, that were taught, that were read, that were quoted. But wait, there's more. Wouldn't it make sense for the one who is called the Word of God, Jesus, to quote the very words that describe Him when He, the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us? Wouldn't it make sense? I think that while the disciples were spending time with Jesus, they were hearing lots and lots of scripture. I, I can't prove it, but it just makes sense. How did they know the scripture so well? Well, they spent time with Jesus. Acts chapter 4 verse 13 tells us that. Acts chapter 4 verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, give you a little bit of background and, and time to catch up. They've been arrested for preaching. Peter and John were on the way up to the temple, and they, remember, they healed the lame man. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of the Lord of Jesus Christ, and has rise up and walk in him. And he, remember, walking and leaping and praising God, he was healed. A big crowd came. Peter preached the message. 
they got arrested for preaching that message. The next chapter is, is Acts chapter 4. Now when, they had, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. What was so impressive about that? Why marvel? Do you ever look at an ignorant and unlearned person and marvel? Well, I do sometimes. Like, how could you be so dumb? No, no. Okay, okay. We send you to school and buy you books, and all you do is eat the covers, right? We mar- no, that's not what they're marveling about. They're marveling about how much they know. These disciples know the scriptures. They're marveling. Why? Because, look at that verse, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them, what? That they had been with Jesus. The disciples, I believe, knew the scriptures because they'd been with Jesus. And the reason I go through all of that is to say this, you can spend time with Jesus. You're not going to walk from the Sea of Galilee down to Jerusalem with him, but you can spend time with Jesus. You can get to know God. You can study the Scriptures. In fact, we are commanded to study the Scriptures. There's one verse in the Bible. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. The word study is used three times in the Bible, one in Ecclesiastes, um, one, I forget the other place, and here, 2 Timothy 2.15, and here's the command, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You can spend time with Jesus, and you can get to know God, and you can learn the scriptures. We've been commanded to. We have been commanded to study the Scriptures. As a side note, I just need to teach you this because I don't want you to get confused. New versions take out the command to study the Bible. I went on to a a website today, just a current website. It's it's one of the websites that you can look at parallel Bible versions, okay? I looked at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and uh, verse 15. The NIV says, do your best to present yourself to God. The ESV says, do your best to present yourself to God. The New King James Version says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. The New American Standard Bible says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. I didn't get that from somebody's book. I went to the website that shows parallel versions. That's what it says. All right? If they got the wrong version of, of what they say is the version that, that I, I don't know. I know that there's differences of opinions on that. Why take out the command to study the Bible? We are commanded to study the Bible. Okay, that was the side note. We're getting back to where we belong. I want to challenge you as Christians to study the Scriptures. To study the Scriptures. Okay, go back to Acts chapter 1 and verse number 15. Acts chapter 1, verse number 15. We've got a problem. Judas, which was part of the the, the apostles, in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of the names uh, together, about 120 men and brethren, the Scripture must needs have been, been fulfilled. And he goes on and he talks about Judas. We've got a problem. We need to solve a problem. Here's what they did. They made real life decisions based on the scriptures. Here's one of the problems that we have. We think the Bible is a great thing for religious studies. It's a great thing to be able to have. And I read, it was a quote, came through one of the news stories. Some rock star as quoted by Rolling Stone, which is a terrible magazine, quoting the Bible and going pretty in-depth about this, the Bible that he had read and stuff. Now, the problem that we have as a, a society and as people, we think the Bible is something that ought to be quoted, but keep it over there in its sphere. Keep it in church. Um... Don't, don't open it and read it in the office because you're going you're gonna to offend somebody. Keep it where it belongs. But what we see here is that they made real life decisions based on the scriptures. And if you will look at the Bible that way, if you will look at the Bible as a place that you can look and make real life decisions like they did. Peter came to the disciples and said, look, we've got a problem. There were 12 apostles. Judas died. I, I've been studying the scriptures and we see... That, that we need to, as we see here, re- replace him. We need to find, the Bible, he said, uh, let his bishopric let another take. That he used the scripture to say, 
Let's solve this problem and use the scripture to do it. If we would do that with our lives, it would help us so very much. They made real life decisions based on the scriptures. They, in verse 21, wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all this time, all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And we see the solution. We won't read all of it. They appointed two. They, they took a vote on it. The lot fell on Matthias. The disciples used the scriptures to help them make a really big decision. Who was going to take Judas's place? Now, I understand. We know that Paul was chosen by Jesus to be an apostle. I understand that. But the Bible doesn't say anywhere that the disciples did the wrong thing in choosing Matthias. They used the scriptures to make a decision, and it was a real life, real world decision. Not, not um, hypothetical decisions, not just spiritual type of decisions, but real life decisions. You can make real life decisions based on the Bible. And I said all of that to say this. If you would get this, it will change you. It will change your family. You can make real life decisions based on the Bible and you can do it tonight. You can do it on the way home. I'm going to help you make this practical. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1 says this. You don't have to turn it, I'll say it to you. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Okay, so if I, if I want to take that and I want to make it practical, God's instructions for a peaceful marriage, let's, let's just go there. How can I have a peaceful marriage? A soft answer. That's practical. I can take the scriptures... And I can use it for real life situations. A soft answer turneth away wrath. So if my wife's mad at me, because she's mad at me a lot, right? If my wife's mad at me and she comes after me attacking me with words, which she never does, if I give a soft answer, I can turn away wrath. Did you know that you could do that? Um, I, on the way home, you can practice this. Proverbs 3, 1 and 2 is a verse that my family is memorizing this week. I'll read it to you. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. God's instructions for a peaceful marriage was a soft answer. God's instructions for a peaceful home to teenagers, to children, obey your mom and dad. Did, did, did you catch that? I mean, this is just, this is practical. This is, I can take the scripture and I can use it in my life. I can use it today. I can, I can use it on the way home tonight. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Okay, obey mom and dad. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add unto thee. I'd love to have a peaceful home. Wouldn't you love to have a peaceful home? Where people get along together. Mom and dad get along and don't fight. Kids don't fight with mom and dad. Kids don't fight with each other. You know, the answers are in the Scripture. And that's just one example of thousands and thousands. They use the Scriptures for real-life situations. If you'll use the Bible as your source for making decisions, you'll put God in a position where He can bless your life. Okay, let's make this just bottom-shelf practical, where any one of us can reach it, okay? We need to learn the Scriptures. We need to learn the Scriptures. We need to get in the Bible and study it and learn what the Bible says. Okay, we've got a couple more. I'm going to give them to you quick. Look at chapter 1, verse 20. Acts chapter 1, verse 20. We've been all over. You're probably thinking, chapter 1, verse 20, what, what book are we talking about? Acts chapter 1, verse 20. All right? Peter is talking to the group of people, and he says this, For it is written in the book of Psalms, and then he quotes the Scripture. Now, I don't know if he had notes here or not. But I made a note here. I wrote this down. They quoted the scriptures. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 16. Acts chapter 2, verse 16. I've got a lot to try to give to you. I don't know that we're going to have time tonight. Peter gets up and he's preaching this great sermon. We would call this a, the, the sermon of the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people are about to get saved and get baptized. Peter gets up, Acts chapter 2, verse 16, and he says, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, I don't know that he has this memorized, but... He's quoting the scripture. If you're to look at Joel chapter 2, verse 28, and I can't take the time to do this. Joel chapter 2, verse 28, 
uh, through 32 is the same thing, almost identically, as Acts chapter 2, verse 17 through 21. What is Peter doing? He's using the scriptures. As he's preaching this powerful message where people are going to get saved, he's quoting the scriptures. There's another example that will be a little faster. Acts chapter 2, verse number 25. Just go to Acts chapter 2, I'm going to read through it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, talking about Jesus, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. This is interesting, he's preaching this message and he's quoting Psalm chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. He's quoting the scripture. Psalm chapter 16, verse 8, I'll read part of that to you. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he's at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. What, what's Peter doing? He's using the scripture. He couldn't have used that scripture if he had not known that it was there. He didn't just randomly open up the Bible, as a lot of people think the preacher does. Just get up here, open up the Bible, say, okay, what are we going to preach from tonight? He studied the scripture. He got familiar with the scripture. Now, he may not have had notes here, but he, he knew what the Bible said. And he was able to use that. In verse number 34, he says this. For David is not ascended into heavens. I'm in Acts chapter 2, verse 34. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. And we see that he's quoting Psalm chapter 110, verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And here's what happens. God uses the scripture to convict the people that are listening. If Peter would have got up and preached a message but not used the Scripture, I don't know what would have happened. But he uses Scripture. And as he's using Scripture, look at Acts chapter 2 and look at verse 36. He finishes up his message this way. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. What happens to the people as they're listening to him preach using the Scriptures? Now when they heard this, Acts 2, 37, they were pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They're convicted because somebody took the time to use the scriptures. The scriptures are powerful. He couldn't use the scriptures had he not known the scriptures, had he not studied the Bible. Listen, we've got to study the Bible. We've got to get in our Bibles. We've got to learn what God wrote to us. They're convicted, their heart is pricked, then Peter shows them how to be saved. Acts 2.38, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then the Bible says a huge group of them got baptized in verse 41. And they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Don't ever minimize learning the Bible. Peter learned the scripture, and he used the scripture we ought to read it, we ought to memorize it, we ought to study it. They quoted the scripture, they used the scripture in real life situations, and they used their scripture knowledge in communicating with the people. Acts chapter 3, Peter and John healed the lame man. After Peter healed the lame man, he preached to the crowd that gathered. It was a spontaneous event. Here's what he says, Acts chapter 3, verse 22. Turn there for a minute, I want you to... I want you to see what Peter preaches to this group of people. This was not a planned service. This wasn't a church service. This was probably on the steps going up to the temple because that's where Peter healed the lame man. And there's a group of people that gather around. Acts chapter 3, verse 22, Peter says this, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet, now what's he doing? He's quoting the scripture. A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say to you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after as many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days. What's he doing? He's quoting the scripture. It was a spontaneous event. He may not have had a sermon to preach in his office titled, In the event that a layman is healed and a crowd gathers. That's not what happened. He just knew the scripture. 
He had studied the scriptures. He had, he, had, he had gotten familiar with the Bible. And I want to challenge you to get familiar with your Bible. We've got to. Christians in our time and in our, in our country, in our culture, for the most part, we are biblically illiterate. We don't know what the Bible says. Peter was doing what we're supposed to do when the Bible says to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That's, that's, that's what he was doing. Do you know where that, where that is found? Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That's in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Interesting that the Holy Spirit later inspired Peter to be the one to write those words. After God had used him over and over to do exactly that. They knew the scriptures, and this is our last point, well enough to use it to defend their position. I'm not going to take a lot of time on this. They learned the scriptures. I'm going to use Stephen as an example. Well enough to be able to defend their position. Can you defend your position? Do you know what you believe? Uh, Stephen did a very good job. We won't read this, the whole passage in Acts chapter 7, verses 1 through 60. It's most of the chapter. But he, Stephen, he's standing in front of the Sanhedrin, the 70 uh, leaders there, the chief priest is there, and he starts at Abraham, and he preaches all the way, that's what we should do tonight, right? Start at Abraham and preach all the way through to Jesus. I might lose you there somewhere. He starts at Abraham, preaches all the way through to Jesus. At the end of his message, in uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 54, the Bible says they were cut to the heart. He knew the scriptures well enough to use it to defend his position. If you don't learn the Bible, you're selling yourself short in this life. You've got to study the Bible. I want to challenge you to study the Bible, study the scriptures. We all need to learn the Bible better. And get this, it's not to know more about God. It's not about a bunch of facts. It's to know God more. You see the difference there? It's not just to know more about God. It's to know God more. You can study the scriptures. You can get to know God. You can learn the Bible. You can use it in your life. You'll have so much more potential to serve God, serve your family, and, a li and live a profitable life if you study the Bible. Okay, so study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of the truth. A simple message. Would you make a commitment? Could we all make a commitment to study the Bible? That's why we made this. So we made this daily devotion journal. Whether you use it or not, doesn't bother me. But it's a tool to help us to study the Bible. I, we went over in our Sunday school class this morning, and some folks had read and, and written some things down. That's awesome. doesn't matter to me how you do it. But would you study your Bible? This is the very first Sunday of 2018. And I want to challenge you to spend this year studying your Bible. Get to know your Bible. Use it in real-life situations. Use it to defend your faith. Use it to make a difference to somebody else. There's so many ways you can use the Word of God, but you got to get it in you. you got to study it before you can use it. Father, I pray that you would use this message tonight to help us to make a decision to study your Word. Lord, I believe one of the reasons you used the disciples in such a great way was that they studied the Scriptures. Lord, please help us to be people that study the Scriptures. Help us to be a church of people to study the scriptures. You gave us everything you want us to know right here in the Bible. And a lot of us, a lot of Christians in our society, we don't spend very much time studying it, learning it, reading it. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to do that.